All right. I know I am live, but just waiting for everybody to sort of filter in, filter in. Hopefully everybody's doing good today. It's a little earlier today, but uh, I did my last uh, episode very late, so. There we go. All right. Hopefully everybody's doing good today. Wait for everybody to get in here, hopefully. Uh, we have a good audience today because it is an important episode that we are uh, embarking on today. There are some very, very big, significant events happening in Ukraine that we're going to uh, cover. Um, some pretty massive breakthroughs, I would say, relative to what we've seen. Um, and then we're also obviously going to talk about uh, possible Israeli strikes. So that's on the uh, docket. Ah, I'm just retweeting my live streams and stuff. Then we'll get right into it. How's everybody doing today? I hope everybody's doing good. Um, I'm always curious where you guys are from. So if you are uh, from somewhere outside of the United States, go ahead and drop that. I'm always I'm always curious as to who uh, <laughs> as to um, where you guys are from. Then go to sleep, dude. Oh, we got somebody from Germany. That's what's up. Spain, Russia. That's that's dope. The UK, Northern Ireland, uh, you know, because you know it wouldn't want them to confuse them with uh, Southern Ireland. Uh, UK, nice. Colorado, Florida. Florida is the fucking spot. Switzerland, Sweden. Awesome, guys. I'm so glad we have people from all around the world in here. Uh, if you guys aren't subscribed or if you have not liked this video, please go do that. It helps me so much. It helps me get seen by new people. We can get more people from around the world in here. Um, I'm so, so happy that I get to be viewed around the world. That is such a cool feeling just to know that, you know, your content is being viewed in uh, Switzerland or uh, you know, Russia or Ireland, UK, Spain, all over the place. That's that's really it's really cool. All right, let's get into it, boys. I hope everybody's doing good. Oh yeah, look at that. I only have sixty viewers on uh, YouTube right now. Uh, somebody said that I might be shadow banned, and it kind of looks like I, I might be a little bit shadow banned. Usually, I instantly get between like three and four hundred viewers in YouTube. So uh, maybe it's just the time of day, but somebody said that they couldn't see my uh, thing when it went up. So that's interesting. We'll see. We'll see if that comes up. Had to happen eventually, boys. You can't go against the narrative the entire time and uh, expect your uh, visibility to be great. That's a big fly in my room. Why is that in here? I don't like that. All right. All right, okay, you guys could see me, so maybe it's just the time of day. That's that's okay. If it's just the time of day, that's fine. All right, let's get into the map here. Um, so we got some pretty major advances uh, all along the front line. Um, up here to the north, uh, I, I don't remember if I specifically had shown the Russian advance all the way through this Dacha area. I'm pretty sure it was just this uh, southern uh, portion or eastern portion of this Dacha area. Um, you can see there's like little shacks kind of basically in here. It's very, very small uh, on the railroad uh, That's and, and on the important high ground. The Russians now have complete control and are about a kilometer away from Orchitney. So Orchitney is now going to become uh, the battlefield. Uh, this also greatly improves uh, Russia's capability of attacking Nova Kalinove over here, uh, which they have already pushed up on this side and are... Uh, there is rumors that there, the fighting has begun in the first buildings of Novo Kalinove, which I believe is over here. Um, so Russians are pushing hard in this area. Um, in fact, I don't know if this is actually Novo Kalinove or if Novo Kalinove is over here. Um, I don't know what this would be called then. I don't know if this is part of Kermak or how the designations work here, but I'm pretty sure that there's fighting happening in this region now, um, which is not good for the overall Ukrainian defense in this area. 
Uh, again, the Russians are going to be pushing up towards Orchitny uh, into this high ground. If Orchitny is captured, uh, this second line of Ukrainian defense right here and potentially the third line uh, further back behind it uh, are going to be completely null and void. Uh, there were reports that Ukrainians basically surrendered in this region. Um, and there have been multiple reports, uh, especially in regards to Chesif Yar, of uh, the Ukrainian 3rd Brigade, which is Azov, um, and <clears throat> other right sector brigades uh, not taking orders and going into battle, um, refusing orders, basically, and saying, like, yeah, we're not going to go in. Because they, every time somewhere is collapsing, uh, these right sector units get thrown in because they're the most fanatical. They won't retreat. They won't surrender. They stick and hold the line, and they delay by time. Uh, it's not a it's not a good job, right? It's a dirty job, and, and it's, a, it's a costly job. And uh, these brigades are done doing it. They're, they're, they're tired of it. They, they get used and used and used. And while they are uh, Nazis, and I don't really care what happens to them, I understand why they don't want to go and just be slaughtered like they did on the backside of Avdiivka. I think Avdiivka was really the wake-up call for uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, oh, and King is from Canada. Welcome from Canada, King. Thank you for your uh, super thanks. Guys, remember, if you want a question uh, posted, uh, you guys can donate through Super Thanks. It's the easiest way to support me uh, financially, uh, which I very much do uh, appreciate. It's it's very helpful for me to continue producing content for you guys on a nearly daily basis. Um, and uh, your question will be put to the top of the um, queue and will be answered uh, absolutely. So if you guys donate, your questions will always be answered. All right. Uh, Okay, so this this is this is major here. This is a very very significant advance. Um, I think this is probably one of the more important advances that is happening because of what it means for the potential kickoff of a Russian offensive towards Pokrovsk. Um, I've said it, and I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to say it in every single video I make. Uh, I believe that the Russian goal right now is to advance towards Pokrovsk. Uh, they're fighting hard in this entire region. We're going to look at some other areas where they're advancing. And these lines are crumbling, and this area is ripe for a Russian offensive come summertime. Um, I think this is where you you will really see the most uh, Russian advance. Uh, and on the back of this collapse, if it if it does indeed happen, uh, this entire front is going to open up because there's going to have to be reserves rushed to this area to try to stem this. Because if 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 nothing happens here, and and there's no defense brought in. Uh, the Russians are looking at a straight shot from Pokrovsk um, to uh, Polvorod, and then over here, uh, what, what, which the Russians call it Polvorod, and then over here to uh, Dniepro and Zaporozhye. I mean, you could see this entire southern flank just collapse um, if massive reinforcements aren't brought in. And the second that happens, the second you know reinforcements are brought in to prevent a collapse here in the south, that's when you'll see an operation for Kharkov, an operation for... Uh, I mean, one of these operations, potentially for Kharkov, potentially maybe in the Sumi region to build that, uh, you know, uh, uh, sanitation zone or whatever they wanted to call it. Uh, or you may see uh, a push for this uh, section of the Oskol, uh, which would also be important for Izium to wrap up the Donbass. It just really depends on uh, where the Russians see the opportunity and where they would they believe it's going to be most beneficial for them to uh, push in this southern region. But I, I, I'm telling you guys, keep an eye on Pokrovsk. It is important. It is a junction. And it is where I believe the Russians are headed. Uh, and you can kind of see it on the map. All right. Uh, here is another big uh, update. We talked about this previously. Um, but uh, here we have oh, oh, people in chat. Goofy. All right. Um, here we have a pretty significant Russian advance. Uh, after the fall of Pervomysky, it was incredibly difficult to hold these very strong fortifications that the Ukrainians have in this area. There is a reason why the Russians have advanced on the bottom into Novelske, on the top in Pervomysky, but haven't been able to capture this uh, big salient right here. Well, that's pretty much done. The Russians have advanced down. Uh, we have rumors of a Ukrainian retreat out of this area. And now the Russians have completely flattened the line from Umansk down to Krasnohorivka, basically. Uh, this is a major improvement from what it originally was, which, if you guys remember, it was uh, basically like uh, this previously. 
down around Vadiane, down here, outside of Pervomaiske, and then down here. So in terms of what the Russians have captured, uh, it's, it's, like, it's something like this. Uh, maybe not so much in this area. This might be a little off, but uh, right here, you can see how much the Russians have uh, captured. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty significant on this FDF salient. And with this with the fall, oops, with the fall of this territory right here, now the Russians can begin operations uh, on th down through this high high ground right here uh, in these open fields, which will allow them to uh, basically blossom out and they'll be able to attack uh, Nelatove. Uh, these settlements all along this line right here. I mean, just look at how empty this is. This is going to become a major, major issue for the Ukrainians as the Russians began branch, branching out, um, and they are going to begin pushing down onto the northern end of Krasnohorivka, which brings us to probably our most significant update for the day. Um, we have, again, another advance by the Russians in Krasnohorivka. Uh, we have a video that I'm going to show, uh, but the title of this video, uh, you know, Turtle Tank, um, is, uh, or Turtle Tank wins the race, sorry. Uh, is because of the action we saw by one of these giant turtle tanks. And if you guys don't know, I'll show you what a turtle tank is. Uh, it's basically a tank that has a warehouse on the outside of it to protect it from uh, FPV strikes. It detonates FPVs early so that the tank's armor just deals with the uh, second penetrative uh, you know, warhead on, the, uh, on a given RPG usually. Um, basically, the tank drove from here all the way up this road, came back, came this way, went all the way down this road, and then jetted all the way up this road, basically into this industrial area. And I will show this full video. Um, I don't care if the video gets demonetized today because uh, I, there's when something is, is, is really, really important and significant, I will always show you guys. So uh, yeah. Uh, oh, you got a question? Uh, this war could have been won last year, I strongly believe. Putin miscompromised something is not uh so I mean you could yeah, that that is he did, I, I think that there were some significant intelligence failures in the beginning uh and you know in return uh, in regards to like Kharkov and how they thought that those cities would just kind of be handed over to the Russians and then negotiations would happen um but since mobilization I mean after that initial failure happened after that initial um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a failure, but that setback happened where, you know, the, the initial plan didn't go the way that the Russians wanted it to. Uh, after that, I mean, basically by midsummer of 2022, when the decision to mobilize and the decision to go onto a war footing and revitalize the military industrial complex in Russia, once that happened, I mean, it was it was a, a ticking time bomb before, you know, we started to see the decay of the Ukrainian military and the strength of the Russian military kind of pass each other on that graph. Uh, strength wise in Ukraine, you know, the Russians had a very small force when they entered of around 180,000 men. Uh, we'll just say 200,000 for a good round number. Uh, and the Ukrainians were dealing with a 300,000 man, well-trained active army, and then 500,000 reservists on top of that instantly. So, you know, there's, there's a, there, there, there is a lot of factors that go into that. I don't think that the, I don't think that Putin is is like failing or anything right now. I think he's actually succeeding quite significantly and he's going to continue succeeding. So, uh, yeah, but uh, I will take us over to that video now on my Twitter so you guys can watch that. Uh, the music is like derpy music, so uh, I apologize, guys. Um, but uh, here we go. Actually, <laughs> Oops. Мужики, тут какая-то странная конструкция. Законно вообще. По камням no, стреляют барашки. Попустите uh, меня. попросите. Уже ни для кого не секрет, что КВ-2 это самая опасная машина. Uh, Поехали, обкатаем. Покажи свою ноздрю. Yeah. Я положу в нее пиво. Это же танки, а не шуток. Ты уж сыграй в Warface. Ой, здесь. Где ты тут? Музыка. Мартан. 
Ну, пожалуйста, не надо. И выйти нельзя, еще напихаю. I didn't pick the music, guys. I don't pick the music. They pick it. But you can see the tank driving all the way up into the industrial area up here. Basically uncontested, no RPG, no infantry. So uh, it's it's pretty safe to say that Krasnohorivka is in a very, very uh, awful position for the Ukrainians if Russian armor is just allowed to drive across the entire town like this. I mean, how... How bad does this look? Uh, this this is deep into Ukrainian controlled territory. Again, you see a few artillery strikes, but really the the, the missing component here is that there is no artillery. Uh, and this tank is rather FPV proof. You can see this little bump on the top. Um, hold on, let me go back to this over here. You can see uh, the, oh, and it almost got hit by an artillery right there. Uh, you can see this little bump right here on the top of the of the tank. Uh, that is, uh, I believe, eight antennas uh, for electronic warfare, which means that FPVs cannot even approach the tank because of the um, uh, the uh, significant amount of electronic warfare uh, defense that is on top of it. This is what you are going to see in the future. You're going to see something like this with every infantry unit and on every single armored vehicle, or at least on one armored vehicle in a given column. Massive aerial denial for FPVs. Uh, the Russians should have one of these at the front of the column and one at the back of the column, and they will drive and prevent FPVs from landing anywhere in the column. If you can, if you have enough resources to make every single tank look like this, you might as well, because this is this is what is going to end up working. It's just it's just a better, it's a it's a cheap and lightweight design that allows you to defend yourself against FPVs until you know the Russians develop something that is universal. Uh, like a universal uh, um, cover, basically. All right. Head back to the map. I'll show you guys kind of that, that the area too. You can see that the tank was driving along this these destroyed industrial buildings right here, or, or these concrete buildings that were destroyed, basically drove up this road and then came up here. And drove right up into around the smokestack and around, uh, I believe, this building right here. It's a little destroyed, so drove up around here. Uh, this is not uh, this is not good. I mean, that's that's basically fifty percent of Krasnohorivka now that is either in the gray zone or under Russian control in this this whole sector. Um, maybe not fifty percent, twenty five percent. Uh, I, I don't usually count this back part. I'm just talking about the actual like main clump of city. So 25%, I would say probably like most of this is in the gray zone or under Russian control, something like that. So that, that th this is very significant. Krasnohorivka is falling in days when it should be taking months. And, and, and I, it's kind of going mostly unnoticed. A lot of people aren't talking about it, uh, but I do believe it's very significant. Hello from Sweden. What are they calling these? Um, I, I've, I've, I just call it the turtle tank. Uh, it's like the ultimate coke cage, but I, I don't know. It works. Mm, all right. I have some articles that I want to show you guys. I think that's it for the map. Let me go check. Let me go check and make sure that's it for the map. Uh, yeah, that little advance down there. Um, oh yeah, I can do this one too. Uh, we got reports that the Russians actually advanced along these two roads in Robitny. Not much. Again, the Russians aren't pushing here. It's just more of an opportunity thing. If the Russians uh, see, see the opportunity to advance because of Ukra you know the Ukrainian artillery and stuff is weak, uh, they will uh, go about doing that. So... Just a little advance in Robitney, but outside of that, uh, the rest of the map is pretty much unchanged. Uh, again, significant advances here towards Pokrovsk. Um, I think that this is where a majority of the Russian advances are going to come over the next uh, three to four months. All right. Uh, how's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? We just hit 20 minutes. Um, we are now going to look at some articles. If you guys have topics or something, go ahead and throw them up in chat. 
I'm always down to talk about, you know, whatever. All right. Uh, so this is important. Uh, again, we've talked about, I've talked about this multiple times, uh, and a lot of people, you know, call me a propagandist for saying stuff like this, but Ukraine is out of air defense missiles. Uh, it's very clear that their, uh, AD is completely compromised on the front line. It's almost non-existent. Uh, Russian drones and aircraft are operating with complete impunity. Uh, Russia has reached a position where it's now looking like they are in definite air superiority. Uh, not quite air supremacy yet, uh, but I believe that we will eventually see uh, air supremacy as well. Uh, the West does not have the ability to produce interceptors in any great rate. Uh, you know, Germany just said that they're going to provide another Patriot, which I don't understand why you need more Patriots if you haven't lost, uh, you know, Patriot batteries. So definitely Patriot batteries have been lost. Uh, I mean, we've seen uh, towels and stuff and radars get hit, but in terms of a total battery, I'm sure that they've lost more than one. Um, but that's not the problem, right? The problem is the pack two interceptors that, or the pack three, uh, we don't send a lot of pack threes, but the pack two interceptors that these require, we don't produce them. We don't produce hardly any of them. And, you know, with Israel and Iran looking like they might go at it, uh, everybody's going to hold on to their missile, uh, defense, uh, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia isn't going to sell theirs. Uh, nobody's going to give away their, their, uh, interceptors because they're gold now they're worth so much more. Uh, than they were previously. Ukraine has been running through them. Israel just uh, launched about a billion dollars worth of air defense assets um, in the in the recent Iranian strike. And that just, I mean, it just, Israel is always going to have priority. Uh, the U.S. military is always going to have priority. And if they're using them and the West was already having issues procuring these for Ukraine, I mean, it's going to be dry. You're going to see a complete drop off of Ukrainian air defense, and it's going to get it's going to make things so much worse on the front line for them. Uh, there's this there's like it's, it's seriously like a trend right now where the Ukraine, you know, like Ukrainian strength is is coming down while Russian strength is going up and they're passing each other on the graph. They, they passed each other long ago. But now that gap is just growing and growing day day in and day out. And the situation has no room for, for improvement for the Ukrainians. I've I've been I've been racking my brain because it's super easy to be like, ah, Russia's winning this, that and the other. Oh, look, Russia's advancing here. Like that's the easy work, right? The, the more difficult questions that you have to ask yourself is what can Ukraine do to win right now? What what is, is Ukraine? What are Ukraine's options? Obviously, I see Ukraine's best option, you know, in the form of negotiations, just negotiate. It's the easiest way to do it, whether you need to force regime change in your country. I mean, I'm talking to the people of Ukraine. What is the best for them? Stop the war. That's that's the first thing. But that doesn't seem realistic, right? We're not going to just stop the war. Zelensky's not going to do that. The West doesn't want that. I mean, the West might want it, but, you know, Ukraine can't do that. So what what are the options? Uh, obviously, pulling back from areas where you can't defend. Uh I know it's bad for PR, but that's something that the Ukrainians can do. Uh, really, really start aggravating the Russians in a way that you potentially force European allies to get involved. I mean, you're escalating to World War III, but if, 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 if it's the, the survival of your state and nothing else matters beyond that to you, I could see that potentially happening. Um, but outside of that, I mean, the, Ukraine cannot force the West's manufacturing to increase, right? Uh, they're trying to pass these bills to put money back into the military industrial complex, which is another thing I'm going to talk about in just a second is the is the bill. Um, I talked about it yesterday on my thing. Uh, but uh, when when you're talking about this bill, you know, of the $40 billion that are allotted for Ukraine, 20 billion of that goes right back into the U.S. Milita military industrial complex and restocking uh, the DOD stocks. Right. Um, so this that money is not even really going to Ukraine and all of the benefits of that money going back into the U.S. military industrial complex. Ukraine might yield something from that in two to three years. Ukraine does not have two to three years. Right. There's not artillery shells lying around. If there were, they would have already been sent. If there were interceptor missiles, they would already be sent. This There's not equipment waiting in Poland to be sent. They're just like, oh, we need the money. No, that's not what's happening. Even if this funding passes tomorrow, the first armored vehicles and stuff you would begin to see would come in the next three to four months. The stuff still has to be procured. I mean, it's not just, again, it's not just lying around waiting to be sent. So 
uh, you know, Ukraine is in a, a very, very difficult situation right now, and it's only going to get more difficult, especially if this uh, Middle Eastern situation escalates into a regional war. Um, there's just not a lot of options for uh, the Ukrainian regime currently in, in how they want to fight this. And things are just going to continue getting worse. And we're seeing that in a lot of these articles and the, the way that they're talking about Ukraine now, the way that even Western leadership is talking about Ukraine, you know, Ukraine is not Israel. They're making that very clear. We will not come to the aid of Ukraine. We will not fight the Russians. The conflict zone is different. I mean, they, they've made it crystal clear that Israel is an ally and Ukraine is a proxy. Hello from London and Rome, Italy and Maryland. I, I, I imagine most of you guys who are reading that, you know, they're typing it in as they come in, but that's, uh, that's cool. I'm glad to see so many people from all over the world. Hopefully you make it to uh, 25 minutes in and you hear me say that. Uh, the chat, you know, the chat is, is, is like live, but it's also people that are watching from the beginning. So uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I have one more article. This one is Sky News, which is not a, a particularly strong news source. So I, I'm not really looking for, at it for any factual like arguments or anything like this. But uh, the fact that we're talking about this, right? It's it's like preparing the audience for what may come. Um, are we heading for World War Three? Multiple different experts in this article uh, weigh in to talk about what they what they think might happen. You have some people saying yes, some people saying no. Um, I am personally in the yes boat. I think that we are, uh, I don't know what happened there. Oops. Um, I clicked the button. Um, I think that we are in a position where world war three has already started. It's already, you know, it has been going on when you think of, of world wars, you know, a lot of people think of world war two as, uh, when Poland was invaded by, uh, Germany, right? That's the start of world war two. That's where everybody starts it. Um, I don't believe that's where World War II really started. I think that that's where we all kind of in the West have come together and agreed because that's when we got involved. But in terms of, and when I say we, I mean Britain and, you know, that the, the world decided that Germany had taken enough steps. But in terms of where the World War actually started, the argument could be made that the Japanese invasion of Manchuria is where World War II started, right? Uh, the argument could be made that the Spanish Civil War, I mean, that's the first time we see German and Soviet proxies coming into conflict with each other, or well, German uh, regulars and Soviet proxies, right? And that's before the uh, Molotov uh, pact that uh, was involved with the uh, capitulation of Poland. So, you know, there's there's like, there's like there's a lot of different places you can talk about this starting. I personally believe that World War III started uh, with the, with, it was basically my, in my, my, my personal interpretation is 2020 when the Azerbaijani Armenian conflict started, that was the start of what we would consider world war three, everything since then. I mean, you could say 2014, the coup or whatever, but there was not really a, a kinetic conflict in the same way that we see now. I really do believe that since 2020, uh, relations around the world, U.S. foreign policy has gotten so poor. Oh, hey, that's when Biden came into office, huh? Oh, shit. I didn't even realize that. 2020. Yeah, that's when Biden came into office. That makes sense, right? Uh, as soon as as soon as 2021 came around, uh, that's when the world war started. Yeah, you guys uh, see, I see people saying like Iraq uh, 2014. Yeah, 2014, you could make the argument that that's when the Ukrainian civil war started, potentially. Um, but I would say Russia's direct involvement in that civil war would be the start of what you would consider World War III. Just like in the Spanish Civil War, Germany's involvement in that conflict is when you would start to uh, talk about, uh, you know, a, a global conflict. Uh, uh, that was the start of World War II. Azerbaijan is a time paradox. Yeah, they're uh... <laughs> so goofy. Um, all right, let's go to... Uh, I just wanted to go and, and talk about some more of my bookmarks. Um, but yeah, you guys can see uh, here. Uh, this, wow, that's a really poor picture. But you can see how the tank came up, uh, came this way, came back around, came up and went up here and finished its little tour at the edge of the industrial zone. All right. Uh, just some interesting headlines uh, to add to what we were talking about. Um, 
China's China's economic growth hits three uh, five point three percent, which is uh, much higher than had been estimated. I've been hearing for the past like five years now that China is going to collapse and their economy is going to die and their housing market's going to crash and uh, this that and the other. And every single time the quarter comes around, it usually paints a much much brighter picture for China than the West would like everybody to believe. So. Um, uh, they seek revival. Um, do they need to seek revival? That's my question. Or are they just kind of growing? Um, and here we go. Another one. Uh, Russia to grow faster than all advanced economies, says the IMF. So now you have Russia in a position where they are the fastest growing economy, uh, one of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, on the back of massive sanctions. Uh, this, this is, so when you talk about multipolarity, multipolarity was in, I would say was in definite question, uh, up until, uh, the sanctions failed. Once the sanctions failed, that's when multipolarity became a very real thing. Uh, that's when Russia, a nuclear superpower in the world, um, and China basically pulled away from the West economically. Uh, you have a Russo-Chinese uh, relationship. North Korea now is uh, free to trade with Russia as they please because they're both sanctioned completely and totally. Iran now has a strong trading partner in Russia. Uh, all of these countries have backdoor trading through China, so they're fully able to trade. This is that multipolarity that you're starting to see. You're seeing India uh, focus on itself, which is another aspect of multipolarity. You're seeing a uh, Large, you know, more uh, aggressive uh, players showing up in South America, you know, Brazil, Venezuela, um, all of these different places. So multipolarity is definitely coming to fruition right now. And I'm not even like the biggest like multipolarity fan. I think that the transition from hegemony into multipolarity is going to be absolutely brutal and could, you know, lead to a, a global thermal nuclear war. I don't think that this is something that's like necessarily like totally beneficial, but you know, it, it, uh, it's what's happening. So all right, if you guys have some questions, you guys can go ahead and get some questions and I'll answer a few and then I'll probably call it. Uh, that's, yeah, that's all I wanted to show today. All right. Uh, are you ready to fight the creatures once fallout becomes a reality? Uh, I, dude, I hope, I hope there's that much wildlife. If, if there's a global thermal nuclear war, I hope the projections are wrong. I hope that the nuclear winter isn't as bad and the famines aren't as horrible as they say they will be. But, you know, uh, I think it's going to be much, much more depressing than fallout, unfortunately. Um, by the way, what uh, was it? A new turtle tank, or was it the first one? Uh, I think they have multiple now. I don't think it was the same one that you saw before. Um, I think that they are just understanding that this design really works, and they're going to keep utilizing it. The uh, you know the massive structure with the antennas. So, all right. Um, talking about nuclear war, thoughts on the new Fallout show? Uh, I really enjoy it. I think they did a very good job. Uh, I'm about four episodes in right now, and it, it it's it's pretty good uh, for what it is. I thought they were gonna. I thought it was gonna be horrible. I thought it was gonna be a train wreck. Uh, after the whole Halo thing, I was like, God damn it, they're gonna ruin another. They're gonna ruin a chance to make something that I love that's niche into something mainstream, and they're just gonna kill it like Halo. Uh, but they did a really good job. I think that it's kind of goofy in the same way that Fallout the Fallout games are. I think they do a really good job of uh, sticking with source material, which is important. Uh, but they and they don't over uh, narrate. You know, they don't um, monologue and uh, they don't go into a bunch of exposition about what's happening. They kind of just say things and move on and you can look it up and figure it out. And I think that that's very important to keep the flow of a show going. So they're not explaining every single little Easter egg that they put in. Uh, do I have a car that can withstand an EMP strike? No, I do not. Um, uh, this is something that I've actually thought about quite a lot. Um, but I have a uh, family that does have a vehicle that uh, can uh, survive an EMP. So I will have some form of transportation in the area. Um, and 
that's part of my bug out plan. So, thanks for the update here in Sweden. No problem, man. I'm glad you're uh, watching from Sweden. Have a good night. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, be on the lookout. I have two new videos that I have just recorded today. So those will be out over the next couple of days. I'll probably re release one tomorrow, maybe one the next day. Uh, one is on Iran uh, and the Israeli strikes, which by the way, I think Israel is going to strike Iran here very soon. I think they've come to the decision. They can't back off and the U.S.'s influence has no meaning. So get ready for Israeli strike and a wider war in the region. There you go. Covered that topic. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you go to the, the description, you can uh, follow me on my Twitter and on my uh, Telegram. If you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you guys share this video, that would be awesome. You know, you guys are what makes this possible. I hope you know that. This is not uh, me. I, I just gather the information. Uh, the fact that you guys are here watching it is, is, is what makes this all happen. So I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. And thank you for being a fantastic community for me. Um, I will see you guys on the next one. Take care, be safe and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.